morning and I hope everything is going well with everyone out there and uh, this morning we are going to continue on with our journey through the Holy Week and um, so let us just open up in prayer Father we thank you this morning Lord and uh, although we are not gathered together physically in one building Lord we are gathered together in our spirit and Lord we ask this morning may you open up our hearts and our minds Lord, so that we can receive what do you say to us. Holy Spirit, we ask may you touch our hearts and draw us close to Jesus this morning. And we pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So, Wednesday. Wednesday went quietly. Too quiet. With the previous three days of drama, Sunday's triumphal entry, Monday's temple cleansing, and then Tuesday's temple controversies, now Wednesday, April the 1st, AD 33, comes like a calm before the storm. But out of sight behind the scenes, lurking in the shadows, evil is afoot. The church has long called it Spy Wednesday, as the dark conspiracy to kill Jesus races forward, not just from enemies outside, but now with a traitor from within. It is the day when the key pieces come together in the plot for the greatest sin in all of history, the murder of the Son of God. The plot thickens when Jesus awakes again just outside of Jerusalem and Bethany, where he has been staying at the home of Mary, Martha and Lazarus. His teaching again attracts a crowd in the temple. But now the Jewish leaders, silenced by Jesus the day before, will lead and be. Today they will avoid any public confrontation and instead connive and part in private. Cephas the high priest gathers to his private residence the chief priests and Pharisees, two competing groups typically at odds. Now they are as thick as thieves as they ache to be rid of this Galilean Jesus. They scheme to kill him but they don't have all the pieces in place yet. They fear the approving masses and they don't want to stir up the assembled hordes and masses and crowds during the Passover. So the plan is to wait till after the feast unless some unforeseen opportunity emerges. Then enters onto the scene the traitor, the miser and his money. The gospel accounts point to the same precipitating event, the anointing at Bethany. Jesus was approached by a woman, and we learn from John chapter, chapter 12 and verse 3 that it was Mary, the sister of Martha. She took very expensive ointment and she anointed Jesus. An objection came from the disciples in verse 4, and it says that it was Judas that said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This was, after all, a very large sum more than a year's wages for a soldier or a common laborer. It would have been enough money to finance a whole family for more than a year and it could have gone a long way for charity. But Jesus doesn't share Judas's miserliness or stinginess. Yet Jesus finds extravagance in his rightful place. Jesus sees in Mary's waste a worshipping impulse that goes beyond the rational, calculated and efficient use of time and money. For Mary, Jesus is worth every single shekel and more. The anointed himself says what she has done is a beautiful thing. Judas, on the other hand, is not so convinced. And, on, and contrary to appearances, his protest betrays a heart of greed. Now, according to John chapter 12 and verse 6, Judas's concern does not come because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. The traitor had long been on a path of sin and hard-heartedness, but the last straw is the extravagant anointing. Irritated about this waste of a year's wages, Satan finds a foothold in Judas's heart 
in his love for money. During the Last Supper, Jesus tells his disciples that one of them will betray him. When they asked who it would be, Jesus said, It is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Jesus then dipped the piece of bread and then he handed it to Judas and he, he identified his betrayer. Now Judas' betrayal was no surprise to Jesus. Jesus already knew what G Judas was going to do. Judas then gets up and leaves and he then goes to the chief priests and this becomes just the window opportunity the conspirators were looking for. Judas is more willing is now willing to play the part of a spy and will lead them to Jesus at the opportune time when the crowds have dispersed and Jesus is alone. And Judas, the greedy betrayer, will do it for only 30 pieces of silver. Exodus chapter 21 and verse 32 establishes that 30 pieces of silver was the price of the life of a slave. So the king of the universe was sold off like a slave. So why the insult of betrayal? Why would God have it go down like this? If Jesus truly is being delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God as according to Acts chapter 2 and verse 23, and his enemies are doing just as God's hand um, had planned, um, as a If Jesus truly is being delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, as according to Acts chapter 2 and verse 23, and his enemies are doing just as God's hand and plan had predestined to take place, as we read in Acts chapter 4 and verse 28, why design it like this, with one of his own disciples, one of his own closest friends, betraying him? Why add the insult of betrayal? To the injury of the cross. We find a clue when in John chapter 13 and verse 18, Jesus quotes Psalm 41 and verse 9, which King David wrote in, wrote in forecasting Jesus' defection. He said, He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. King David knew the pain, not just of being conspired against by his enemies, but being betrayed by his very friend. And so now the son of David, Jesus, walks the same path. Yet Judas, one of the twelve that was close to Jesus, turns on him. Soon Peter will deny him. And then the remaining ten will scatter and run off, leaving Jesus to face this night alone. From the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, the disciples has always been by his side. They have learned from him traveled with him, ministered with him, been his earthly companions and comforted him as he walked this otherwise lonely road to Jerusalem. But now as Jesus' hour comes, his burden he must bear alone. The definite work will be no team effort. The anointed must go forward unaccompanied as even his friends betray him, deny him and leave him. He is forsaken by his closest earthly associates, one of them even becoming a spy and a traitor against him and selling him out. And not even for a whole lot of money, but it was for a small amount of money as if he wasn't even worth more. But even this is not the bottom of Jesus' anguish. The depth comes in the cry of distress when Jesus is on the cross and he cries out to his father, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But now even more remarkable than this depth of forsakenness that Jesus finds himself in is the height of love that Jesus will show. Greater love is no one than this, that he lays down his life for his friends even when they have forsaken and left him. So the actions of others even that of his close friends, did not cause Jesus to deny himself and who he is. He did not let it change the purpose for what he came. He still continued on being who he is, 
God and God is love and thus he still acted in love and he goes to the cross which is the greatest demonstration of the love of God. Thank you.